All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and thank you so much for joining me today on Adobe Live for an audio masterclass around how to choose the best or really the right microphone for your voice or for your particular recording situation. It's interesting, actually, over the last couple of weeks, you know, obviously since everyone's kind of working remotely and trying to figure out new solutions to do things and how to communicate, a lot of questions about using the right microphone. Are they choosing the right microphone? Are they positioning the microphone correctly? Why does it sound thin? Why does it sound too boomy? Why is it too bassy? Why doesn't it sound, why is there no sound? So today I thought I would cover a whole bunch of things and we're gonna be showcasing all different types of mics, some really cool vintage ones like this one that I have here. This is an AKG D12E from 1968, also known as the Ringo kick drum mic. This is one of my all time favorites. I've had this for a super long time. And we're gonna cover the differences between the different types of microphones that you'll encounter like dynamic and condenser, talk a bit about pickup patterns, and then actually audition the sound of each of these to kind of give you an idea of sort of what they sound like and how and what you can kind of expect um, when recording with these devices. So as always, we're coming to you live on Behance, Adobe Live and YouTube, as well as uh, Facebook. So be sure to join the chat over on behance.net slash Adobe Live. That's where the conversation is happening. That is the chat that I'll be following. So you definitely want to go over there to ask your questions and uh, start engaging. All right. Very, very cool. Yes. Oh, Jan Eric, you've already uh, <laughs> you've already beaten me to it. My favorite Harry Potter line. We will revisit that later. What's up, Keith Aguilar, Cody Bear, loving vintage mics. Steve, how's it going? D. Flynn, nice to see you. Tunch, nice to see you. Andreas, hello. Jennifer Thompson, Chris, all right. And Wade and Colin, always such a nice, big international audience. And coming to us over on Twitter, Periscope, we've got Gary and Desiree and Skusuma as well, among many others. Okay, Fo My Life, great to see you as well. Awesome. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to switch over to my screen. But before I actually um, get into recording mics, and getting into all of that, there's some things that need to be shared because this is a master class. So we're going to have a little sort of education here around microphone basics. And again, I've been seeing a lot of stuff over the last couple of weeks, some of which, quite frankly, is a bit frightening because there's just a lot of misinformation out there. You won't get that here. You're going to get information here. So let's talk about microphone types first and foremost. Okay. Now there are essentially four, four major microphone types. They are dynamic, condenser, ribbon, and PZM. The latter two you will unlikely ever have to encounter unless you're a recording engineer like me and using them in a studio. Uh, these are not readily available. They're not for typical voiceover or podcast. These are really specific to, you know, instrument recording, live type recording and halls and things like that. You're never really going to need to encounter those. And I wouldn't recommend attempting to use one of those for podcast or live streaming either, because there's certain considerations when using ribbon and PZM. The two main ones that we're going to focus on are dynamic microphones and condenser microphones. So a couple of classic dynamic microphones that many of you will be familiar with. The Shure SM58, which I actually have uh, off, off camera right here. We're going to be testing this one out in a little bit. This is probably one of the most common and most recognizable dynamic microphones out there. It's used on stage. It's used in the studio. It is virtually indestructible. It has been around forever. It's got this built-in windscreen, and we'll talk a bit about that. Um, and it's just a rugged, solid, kind of works on everything from voice to guitar to kick drum to, you know, ambient outdoor recordings. It's a staple, it's very inexpensive, and it's uh, accessible to everyone. Now, another really common mic that you see, and in fact, I believe we've got some of these in the Adobe Live Studios in San Francisco. A couple of my colleagues use these. I know a lot of uh, broadcasters use this. This is the Shure SM7B. Now, this is yet another uh, dynamic microphone. 
It's worth pointing out, by the way, that these dynamic microphones, including this Electro Voice RE20, this is another really common one that you see, especially in, stu in radio and broadcast studios. It's been around forever. It just has that kind of radio sound. But there's two key fundamental things about dynamic microphones. First of all, well, three, they don't require any additional power. And we'll get to that when we talk about condensers. Condensers use something called phantom power. You might see on your sound devices or something that's a little annotation that says plus 48V. A lot of times you can also use batteries to power condenser microphones. Dynamic mics don't require any such thing. You basically plug them in, set the gain, and you can start going. Now, the other thing to keep in mind with dynamic mics is that these are also known as top address microphones or front address, meaning that you sing into the top of, that's where the capsule is at the top. Similarly, down here, you would put your mouth where I'm circling right here or right here. These are not meant to be uh, spoken to perpendicularly from the side. And this is a really common problem that I see with people using things like Blue Yetis. We'll get to that in a minute. So dynamic microphones typically are top address, front address microphones. The other thing is that dynamic microphones by nature also allow you to take advantage of something known as proximity effect. Now the microphone that I use for my uh, regular streams here and here, I can just kind of cut to this real quickly. Where did I put that? Oh, it's right here. Uh, here, I've got this other camera. So this is my, we're gonna talk about this one in a minute. This is uh, an Audio-Technica AT4050 multi-pattern condenser. Uh, I don't need to be very close to this microphone at all. In fact, you want to be a bit further away. By nature, condenser mics will pick up a, a slightly larger frequency response, and you don't want to get too close because any sort of low frequency in your voice can really get over-accentuated, and you'll incur uh, not only plosives, but sometimes distortion. Dynamic microphones want you to be right on top of them. And, and the term in radio is kind of like eating the mic. You want this thing, whoa. you'll see singers like in videos, right? In these mics, they're screaming, ah, because that's where you wanna be. By doing that, it's going to still deliver a very clean sound, but it's also going to amplify and accentuate low frequency in a very warm, nice sounding way. That's called proximity effect. That's why these latter two microphones in particular are so popular in radio, because even if you've got a thinner, smaller voice, if you bring one of these in and you speak on them correctly, which is known as being on axis, and again, really right up front, you're going to get a very rich, warm, full-bodied kind of sound, okay? Make sense? Looking to see if we've got some cues already. We're gonna go over the Yeti in just a second, Jennifer. Awesome, awesome. Alicia, this is so good. Very nice. Oh yeah, Steve, <laughs> Steve's trying to scroll, okay. All right, so let's go to a couple condenser microphones. So again, I just listed, now this happens to be an AKG. This is either a 4060 or, or a 2020, I can't remember. Uh, I've got the 4060, that's a tube-based version of this mic here. There's also the very popular uh, AKG C414B. This is, um, oh, and actually that should be AT, not AKG, that's a typo. Uh, the C414, you see this a lot with uh, late night talk show hosts. Jay Leno used to use one of these. I think Jimmy Fallon might still use one. They also have these with a silver capsule. By the way, these are known as side address microphones. And you can tell that because, see this huge thing? These are what are also known as large diaphragm condensers. You see this big circle right here? Yeah, that's where your voice needs to go, all right? If you're singing from the top, <laughs> like this, you're doing it wrong. You are off axis, you're not getting the benefits of using that microphone correctly, and your sound is going to be a bit whack. So these are side address microphones. Now, all three that I have here are also what are known as multi-pattern. And here, I'm gonna show you on this other 4050 that I have here. I think I can, I can probably do this a bit more elegantly here. You're getting a full, full little tutorial right now. All right. So with a lot of your condensers, uh, it's not quite focusing as, a, as much as I'd like. Uh, that's all right. So first of all, you'll see that it has this low cut filter. All right. So this is great when if, you know, let's say you already have sort of a naturally bassy voice and you want to roll off frequency. This is, I think, uh, around 80 hertz. You can enable this low frequency cutoff and it's just going to eliminate 
all of that low end kind of thumpy rumbliness and it's wonderful. Now what this also has is a pad on here. So again, for super hot signals, you can implement this 10 dB pad, which automatically attenuates the pickup of that large diaphragm condenser capsule. So it's, uh, it's less sensitive to higher sound pressure level, all right? And then the other thing that you have here is this multi-pattern selector. And by default, we're gonna cover uh, pickup patterns in just a second. This microphone does cardioid, which we'll talk about. That's the most standard and certainly for all of your dynamic microphones. Uh, Omni and figure eight. And you can probably guess what figure eight is. And when it's figure eight, that actually allows you to sing on either side of the microphone when you enable that function. So if you've ever seen like classic studio pictures uh, of you know the Beatles in the studio, John and Paul, and they're singing face to face like that, they're using a figure eight pattern on what is most typically in those days, a Neumann microphone like the one that you see on screen here, okay? Um, that's a figure eight pattern. A lot of your condensers will have that if they're multi-pattern condensers, okay? Now, condensers also have more sensitivity. So again, a lot of your people mentioning Yetis and things like that, you know, if you've ever wondered why it tends to pick up everything, and the Yetis in particular, I'm not a huge Blue Mics fan in general. It's nothing against Blue. It's just I don't care for them myself sonically, and they don't work for my voice. Um, they pick up everything, and they're very, very sensitive. So again, the dynamic mics, while they may have a similar frequency response, that's the frequency that they capture at the lowest end and all the way up to the highest end, they're a little more forgiving. They're going to capture a little less background ambience. Condenser microphones, if you're not in a really quiet space, they're going to pick up everything. But that's the nature. They're going to pick up the clarity and the, and the, and the, uh, the sparkle that exists, which is why you will see these used for vocals. You'll see these used for acoustic guitars. And there's many varieties of condensers. There's also, by the way, front uh, top address condensers as well. You also you, These are often like the cigar style mics. This is what I used recently for our Masterclass live stream when I was at the piano. Those were top address condensers pointing straight down on the piano, okay? A little bit on those condenser microphones. And then we get to our USB and mini plug microphones, which can be a combination of dynamic and condenser, all right? So you can see here this familiar Rode one. I actually have an older version of that too. All right, we can cut back to this cam for a second here. So this is a battery powered condenser mic with a hot shoe. This goes right into the camera records in dual channel mono, which, you know, they say records in stereo, but you know, it's really dual channel mono. Um, that's a condenser variety. That's Samsung, Samson OU01U. Again, this is a bit old now. I think they're on the O2 now. Uh, also is a front address. Oh, sorry, this is a side address uh, condenser. And then here's your blue Yeti. Now, again, the way that this is positioned right here, that's the way you should be speaking into the Yeti with that volume and the, the logo facing you. When you see people who've got the Yeti tilted like this and they're, they're speaking into the top, it's not, a, it's not a top address mic. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> so when you hear a lot of like, why does it sound? Maybe you're getting an echo reflection from your desk because the sound is bouncing off of that and into the capsule, or it sounds further away, or it just sounds different because you're not speaking into the capsule directly. So it's always a good idea to understand where the pickup of the microphone is supposed to be. I can't tell you how many times I've seen not just Yetis, but other things that are just improperly placed, especially these, these condensers where they're at like top address, but totally missing the boat there, all right? All right, and shotgun. Yes, we're gonna get to that too. So now I'm gonna cover that in a moment. We're gonna cover that when we get to um, pickup patterns, but I will show you. So right up here, this is uh, a staple in the shotgun world. This is the Sennheiser MKH416, probably the most common, the most famous uh, shotgun variety. This one is also a condenser mic. So again, it requires phantom power. Uh, it has incredible, incredible sonic clarity. It also has incredible noise rejection. And that's based on the pickup pattern, which we're gonna cover here in just a second. Um, and this can be used, this is used in studios for dialogue replacement, you know, on scene, on, you know, on set live dialogue capture. It's an extremely powerful microphone. And uh, again, if you're going to be using 
uh, stuff outdoors and things. This is the kind of this is the kind of setup that you want. All right, and I talk about a couple of other mics here. You know, the Apogee uh, 96K mic. This one I turned Terry White on two years ago. Absolutely works for his voice. Loves it. This is another great one, and it's USB. It is Phantom Power as well. Okay. But it's bus powered phantom power. So it doesn't actually, let me rephrase that. It's bus powered. It doesn't require phantom power. Sorry. Okay. So let's get into some of the pickup patterns here. All right. So we were just talking about these moments ago uh, when you have, and uh, sorry that it's a little blurry on screen here, when you have multi pattern microphones. So the first here is omnidirectional. And as the circular pattern illustrates, that is a microphone that picks up from all positions. So think of that, Now that doesn't mean 360 because ambisonic is a completely different thing. But this is the kind of microphone that if I put this mic right here into Omni, it just picks up from all sides, right? So let's say that we wanted to record something like um, a conference room session. You would use Omni because then it just picks up from, it picks up the entire room. Now with that said, it picks up the entire room. So you're gonna hear all the noise, all the ambience, all the glottal sounds from everybody's mouth, um, depending upon the sensitivity of the microphone. You don't typically, you don't typically, you know, use Omni unless you're trying to capture, you know, global room ambience. And if you're doing an interview, you're not gonna use omnidirectional, okay? So again, there's reasons to use it, room tone, ambience capture, but if you're trying to do like direct interviews, you do not want to be on an omni pattern. Now the next one here is cardioid, okay? Now this, as you can see, illustrated, this being where the front of the capsule is, it picks up mostly from the front, and you can see it has some very nice rear rejection here. Not total rear rejection, meaning it's not, it'll still pick up some sound from behind it, but largely it's filtered out based on this cardioid pattern. This is what most of your commercial microphones, podcast microphones, almost every microphone that doesn't have, that is not omni, okay, is going to be cardioid. If it only has one pickup pattern, it's going to be cardioid, all right? Most common, clean sound, real nice. All right. Bi-directional, just kind of skipping ahead here, you can see that's the figure eight. So you can see it picks up from the front or wherever the, you know, this, both sides of the capsule, right? So you can have two heads side by side or face to face rather, singing, harmonizing. That pattern is wonderful. I see that a lot with background vocals. I love capturing vocals like that. Whenever I capture hand claps, if I can get a group of people, I do it with figure eight and it gives you kind of this just nice, very, just homogenized kind of sound. And then you have the last two, which is hypercardioid and supercardioid. And the MKH416 is what we call a supercardioid pickup pattern. So it only picks up audio from the front at a very narrow, uh, in a very narrow space. And it has almost complete and total rear rejection here, okay? So that's why this is so good for being on set. You know, even if you're in like a windy outdoor environment, these things are laser focused, but that also means your positioning of them needs to be laser focused. When you see the boom operators, you know, and they're holding those mics, that capsule, that front end of the capsule there, and that's another good example. This is a, a top address condenser, right? You've got to position that right where the mouth is. And think of it this way. Think of it when you're setting your aperture on your camera, right? You can have things wide open or super, super tight and closed, right? You've got to have this really, really close, really, really small to really focus in on where that mouth is. Because if you move 10 degrees to the left or right, you're, you're, you're off axis and you're not going to pick up the best sound, okay? But when you're dialed right in, it's amazing how good the sound is and how just full bodied it is, okay? So... These are the kind of things that you need to be aware of when you're picking up your microphone, okay? Minty, what's up? Damn, cardioid kind of thick, though. <laughs> Very nice. Oh, and labs as well. Did I put, where did I put that lav mic? Oh, I had it on the table somewhere here. I don't know what I did with it. Um, oh, Ant, love it. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, yes, and you, most of your lavalier mics, these are typically also condensers, right? Clip-ons that you'll do here. I don't, I don't, I put it on the floor. Oh, it's on the floor. Hold on. Just grab it. Oof. This is live. Why can't I just get up? Okay. 
So here is, uh, by the way, you know, can you tell I used to own studios and I'm a bit of a mic closet nerd. So again, let's switch over to the Brio cam here. So typical, uh, typical setup for a lav mic. All right, here it is. Okay, sorry, it's a little blurry there. Uh, condenser, it's got a little pack in the case right here. This is where it's battery powered. That powers the um, that powers the need for phantom power. And you've got a couple of clips on here. And this just, again, gives you a nice, clean, full frequency, full spectrum kind of sound, okay? And those are, um, you know, they're wonderful. Now, again, they're also sensitive to shirt movement and other things like that. So depending upon the situation you're in, where you're recording, how you're doing it, a lot of times I will instead use something like a shotgun with a boom because then I don't have to worry about rustling and movement. And, you know, just it also just depends who's talking. I'm pretty animated, so, and my hair is getting, you know, you don't want to use a, a lav with me. You're just going to get constantly. Whereas if you're feeding a boom, it's just going to be direct sound and really lovely. All right. Fresh cake. Got to get a floor cam to cut away. Oh, we've got the floor cam. Well, I mean, technically, right? That's this one. Cams on cams on cams. All right. Uh, okay. Let's see what else we got here. All right. All right. Jan Eric, yep, just talked about that. Okay. Sparkle. Nice. Keith. Okay. All right. I had a lot of training videos at my last job, and we called some of them eating the mic. Must have been condensers. No, no. So again, if 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 they really wanted you to eat the mic, you don't want to eat a condenser because you're probably going to incur an over accentuation of bass versus you do want to eat the mic with dynamic microphones like this short, which we're going to get to in just a few seconds here. All right. OK. Uh, who has ever been bitten by a vampire clip? <laughs> Why do all of these masterclass teachers use Macs, Minty? No, we don't all. Um, that's just my main production machine. I switch between Mac and PC. Um, largely, I, I do this because it just integrates with all the other stuff in my home. So that's the reason. Use PC if you want. It's a choice. I like to use both every now and again. All right. Meanwhile, the only webcam I've got jitters. OK. <laughs> OK, so let's go and go into some recording. Oh, and then yes, and then the last thing that I'll show you here uh, let's see, sparkles. Yes. Is this is a, now I didn't have any, I, I never use USB microphones. It's also worth pointing out by the way that, um, uh, all of these mics here are analog. So they're connected via an analog XLR cable. All right. You can see that also known as your Canon plug. And that is fed into my sound device here, where you have the analog to digital conversion happening. Now, a lot of people ask, because a lot of the newer microphones out there, you have mics that simulate like this Audio-Technica that I'm using. They're far less expensive. They're a condenser, but they're USB. And a lot of people will say, well, and maybe they even have an XLR version of the USB microphone. And they'll be like, well, which one is better? Here's the thing, um, when they're USB, they have circuitry built into them, which means that the analog to digital conversion is happening on device. To be honest, it's not always the best, even with good USB microphones. Now, some better than others. I would say the Apogee series, Apogee still probably does, but back in the 90s, they were no, they were a, a an A to D conversion. That's what they built. They built little black boxes that did analog to digital conversions for doing tape to digital transfers. In my earliest days as a mastering engineer, we had a whole series of Apogee A to D converters and then D to A for the playout of the systems. Not all are created equal. So when you're going into something like my sound device here, which is the Focusrite Claret, the analog to digital converters are amazing. I mean, that, that's what you're paying for. With a Blue Yeti or even the AT2020 USB, it's just not as good, all right? Now, are most people going to be able to tell? No. 
Well, audio nerds, eh, maybe. Again, a lot of it has to do with how are you positioned when you're recording, right? How are you recording it? Is your gain proper? Are you pr doing proper gain staging? All of these things matter, but that's just something to, to be aware of. And when people say like, oh, is it the same? They're not the same, okay? Going analog versus USB, it's just not the same because the analog to digital conversion for USB is happening on the device. Whereas when you're going through your sound device, that's something that's designed, it has a preamp, and that preamp circuitry feeds an analog to digital converter where they've probably spent a little bit more money to make that a little bit more transparent and a little bit cleaner, okay? Not that they can't be good, just something to be aware of, okay. And yes, Chris is saying, not same could be said about audio interfaces, not all equal in quality, absolutely. The truth is, you know, in 2020, they're all pretty good. I mean, all of them now do, I've got some rogue hairs here, all of them now do, uh, you know, 20, 24 bit, most of them now go up to 192 kilohertz sample rate. So they all have similar specs, but yes, they are not all created equal. All right. Exactly. Henrik is saying same with cameras. Yep. Absolutely true. And Tunch, which sound card? So yeah, so I'm using a Claret 8, which is a, an 18 or 20 input racked device feeding audition. And then coming out of this system, it's feeding into the streaming system, another Focusrite device. All right. <laughs> Steve, I love that. Yes, pay 100 an hour. Uh, two. <laughs> you need the Jason, how to buy a microphone. All right, nice. On your phone. Love it. Okay. All right, so let's get into some recording. And this is my one USB headset mic option that I have here. All right. So a um, couple of additional things before we get rolling. So first of all, when you're in Audition here, we're gonna go into audio hardware. Now we're gonna start by using some of these analog connected microphones first. So you can see that um, under our audio hardware, under default input, I see a bunch of devices. So here's my Thunderbolt device, okay? Now I've got this Brio camera on the machine. That also has a microphone, I could use that. This is the Plantronics USB. We'll use that in a couple minutes. And then this is a, a Pro Tools aggregate device, which it automatically uh, installs when you install Pro Tools, which will take, it'll aggregate multiple USB and or mini plug devices into one. A lot of people ask me, um, can you use multiple USB devices in Audition? Well, as you see, let's say that I had a second USB microphone plugged in here. You can only choose one for the input. So the way that you have to do that is by creating an aggregate device. And you can do that via the, what is it? The audio MIDI setup. Now, again, this is a little different on Windows, obviously, but this is where you do that on the Mac. I get asked this question all the time, right? So people are like, how do I, how do I record my Plantronics USB? I'm doing a podcast and then I have someone else on a, a Blue Yeti. So you would come down here and you would create the aggregate device, all right? And then from there, then you can assign different inputs to that aggregate device. And then that's what you choose inside of Audition if you wanna record that way. I don't really recommend that all the time. There's also, again, now it's going through this other thing inside the OS. Mm, quality changes, you know, there's, you know, just be aware, all right? Things can happen, okay. Uh, and then default output, we're gonna go out through the focus right here, okay? And then you'll see here, we've got our channel mapping. So depending upon if you're recording in the multi-track uh, or the, um, the uh, single track view here, typically for the single track view, I will assign, I usually do that via input six, which is this Audio-Technica 4050 right here. This kind of shows you all of the inputs on this device, all right? And then it's showing you all the various outputs, okay. So let's start with the AT4050. Now, again, this is a multi-pattern condenser microphone. You'll also notice that I'm recording into a mono track here, all right? Now, by default, Audition uh, will, show, will give you a whole bunch of stereo tracks. Now, you can record a mono signal into a stereo track. It's still only going to record um, one mono wave file based on how you set the input device, right? So I have this set to record mono input number six. Now, if I were to do stereo input five, so this is five, six, well, five is on the left, six is on the right. This happens to a lot of people. They're like, ah, oh, how come, why did that happen? Well, 
you chose a stereo input for a mono device, right? Now, a lot of people ask, well, how come some microphones, they record in stereo? Remember like this road, you look up roads, like the camera, the shotgun and video mics, and it'll say stereo recording. And it does in fact have a stereo tip ring sleeve end. Yes, but that, now some of them are actual stereo. This one here, this is old school, this video mic, it's dual channel mono. It's just mirroring what's in both channels. So that's fine too. You can have a stereo file to channel that has the same content in both sides. But if you're starting fresh, single input, single device, single input, mono track, all right? Just a good habit to get into. The only reason you don't wanna necessarily do a stereo, uh, a mono recording and a stereo track or vice versa is that when you start applying effects to those things, weird stuff starts to happen. And that's because it doesn't know how to, how to feed the signal. It's looking for two channels of input. It only has one. So you, you will likely with some effects get an imbalance and it can be a real drag. Ant Pruitt, yes. What's up, Misty? Good info on the USB mics. Okay, sweet, love it. Okay. Hey, Sorsa, what's happening? All you know how to do is plug in and pray. Yes, and that's the beauty of the USB variety, right? You just plug in and go. You don't really have to do very much. Typically, they might have an input level setting on the front or something like that. When you're using analog, you have to manually set the inputs and then you're dealing with mixers and all that other stuff. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me as I'm getting kind of hoarse. So, all right, we are armed for recording, okay? And why don't I go ahead and uh, just, you know, say a little something here and then we will take a listen back. Okay, here we go. Hi, this is Jason Levine and you are listening to the Audio-Technica AT4050 multi-pattern condenser. Now this particular mic that I'm speaking on is actually the exact same mic that I've sung every track I've recorded for the last 25 years since having my first studio in Nashville down off of Music Row. It's one of my all-time favorites and it just speaks to perfectly the sound of my voice. Okay, so I've now recorded this track. Now one of the things that you'll notice is that it's very even, right? Now part of that, almost entirely, is because I speak for a living. <laughs> so I know how to control my dynamics. Also, I don't use pop filters generally. Now that's not to say that I never incur popping peas, plosives, that's that big little burst of air that you'll get. Um, but I know how to slightly lift off axis to prevent some of those things. I wasn't really doing it here necessarily, but a lot of people would say, how come you're not using a pop filter? Well, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. When singing, when I know it's gonna be a bit louder and a bit more intense, I will in fact generally use a pop filter because you know it's coming from the diaphragm. It's still coming from the diaphragm when I'm talking, but it's a little bit different and a little bit more controlled in here, right? But that's one of the things is that this microphone produces a really wide, perfect, beautiful spectrum. Let's go ahead and listen back to this. Hi, this is Jason Levine, and you are listening to the Audio-Technica AT4050 multi-pattern condenser. All right, let's go into the edit view here. I'm just gonna make this a little bit louder, because again, this is completely untreated. So I can just adjust the amplitude right on screen here with this little uh, heads up display. We can play it back from here. Hi, this is Jason Levine, and you are listening to the Audio-Technica AT4050 multi-pattern condenser. Now, this particular mic that I'm speaking on is actually the exact same mic that I've sung every track I've recorded. All right, now I want to point something out. Remember, I talked about the bass roll-off, okay? Now, first of all, you notice I said something about particular. All right, if I could record a little greeting demo in Spanish, Dutch, and French, that would be great. I could do that. <laughs> actually know more Dutch and French than I do Spanish, which is odd because I live in Arizona. I know very little. I, I know some. I'm bad. I need, to, I need to learn more. Should have. I should have studied Spanish. I studied French, which was great, but it's just not used as in, a many, as in, in as many places. Okay. Uh, what was I saying? I'm not sure. Oh, bass roll off. So again, I have the 80 hertz roll off implemented on here. So it's automatically, when I'm speaking into this condenser, it's automatically rolling that off. It's not even capturing any of that. So for one thing, plosives tend to be below 100 hertz. So it's gonna minimize any instancing of that. 
Additionally, you can visually identify that. If you look here on our frequency analysis graph, okay, approximately this is 80 hertz right about here, and you can see that there's this dramatic slope, right, just eliminating all of that low end. Not the good low end, right? It's still warm. I've recorded for the last 25 years since having my first studio in Nashville, okay? It's still warm. It's got perfect just mm, brightness and clarity and sparkle, but it doesn't have any over accentuated bass. Now, if I wanted this a little bassier, a little, again, and again, I've got the fans going on the streaming system here. I would probably take that bass roll off, off. I would lift it, right? And then it's capturing everything all the way down to 20 hertz. Most of these microphones will have very similar, it's what's called the frequency response. The lowest frequency it can capture up to the highest frequency it can capture. This one I believe is, most condensers are what they call 20 to 20, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. Um, it's wonderful having that implemented. So again, when you're searching for a microphone, if you encounter a lot of plosives and a lot of low end issues in your room, in your environment, might not be a bad idea to look for a mic that has a bass roll off, okay? Very cool. All right, so that is the AT4050 multi-pattern condenser, all right? Let's go back into our multi-track here, just check quickly. If I have a, the understanding of romantic languages, I should catch it quickly. Yes, stuff does, I'm able to, you know, I'm able to translate, it's just I can't speak as many. I've heard many good things about Audio-Technica Source. Yes, it is my by, b absolute favorite brand. And this leads me, thank you very much for that, right into a comment that Jan Eric said at the beginning, which is when choosing a microphone, it's not just about choosing the one that's the most aesthetically pleasing in your studio, although that matters too. But for all my Harry Potter fans out there, who's a Harry Potter fan? Let me know in the chat right now. Say, I love Harry Potter. Much like was said to Harry in the first film, first book, the wand chooses the wizard. The microphone kind of chooses the voice, all right? Not all mics sound good on every voice, and even the same mic can sound different on the same voice, okay? Some voices are better suited for uh, condenser microphones just by the nature of their sound. Some voices are truly better suited for dynamic microphones, all right? If you've ever heard voices that, again, by nature, are maybe a little bit brighter, maybe there's a bit of a mid-range edginess to them, a dynamic microphone like an SM7B might be a really good idea, all right? Versus something like, a large diaphragm condenser, which is really going to accentuate that mid-range crunchiness, that high-end brightness, okay? So it's really a good idea to audition a couple and try and listen for, you know, what do these actually sound like on my voice? And I just gave you kind of a basic guideline. It doesn't necessarily always apply. As I said, now when I did the, the piano stream a few weeks ago, I sang on this very SM58 right here, this one. Because again, for like live voice, it's great, all right? We're gonna talk about pop filters in a second when I get to this one. Um, again, this one has it built in on the capsule, which you can screw off, by the way. Okay. Uh, did it? I shall now hug my wand, Jennifer. N nice. Hufflepuff, Cody, I knew that. <laughs> Krista, Hufflepuff, nice. Dipankar, excellent. Sorsa, knew it, all right. <laughs> That's so great. I am a Gryffindor, all right? Uh, okay, hold on, we had a couple questions here. Jan Eric's asking, I often have to mute the low end 20 hertz slider on my system equalizer when viewing some streams as their mics pick up the super low rumble from their AC or PC in their room. What's going on there? Well, yeah, now again, um, it, it's, you're not, I would probably say you probably want to roll off 40 and below because 20 is is, is not necessarily audible, but can be felt for sure. Um, and yeah, it's just depending upon how they're positioned, you know, this mic is is on a an old school, this is a 60s desktop mic stand. All right, this was given to me by uh, by a teacher of mine in high school. Who says I throw things? I don't throw things away. I really do. But um, yeah, this was actually given to me. I mean, it's like 
old old school. It even smells old. It doesn't really smell, but I mean, it it, it has that kind of that old school vibe to it. Sorry, I'm making a bunch of noises. I pick it up. Um, so depending upon how it's mounted, you know, this other mic again, it's on a boom arm here. It has uh, uh, a, a special shock mount clip. That's the other thing. How you have the microphone clipped to the stand. If you're using the standard microphone clip, there's no shock absorption there versus if you're going to something like this. Now, this one, this mic here actually has, this is shock absorbing, right? You're seeing me move it there. Now, it's still going to pick up some of that rumble from the table. That's partly also why I have that, uh, that uh, 80 hertz roll off. But this one too, this is... Uh, this is a shock absorber. These are little bands here. So this one is not going to pick up any unnecessary uh, low end frequency because it's mindful of the space that it's in and how it's mounted. So um, that's always something you got to consider. And yeah, it just happens a lot. I mean, can't really fault everybody for not having those setups perfect, especially if they're not doing it all the time. But um, yeah, I've run into it too, Jan Eric. Okay. All right, startup Sanatana. With frequency perspective, is voice can be unique where one can think of some kind of biometric voice authentication. Are you asking if voices can be unique enough for bio? Yeah, I mean, sure. That being said, you know, sonically, digitally, as I've shown in our spectral frequency display, while voices definitely have unique prints, there's also ways that you can modify and modulate your own to sound like another. So this is one of those things that, uh, you know, uh, is, is one of the very hot topics, right? Henrik is saying SM57 versus MD421. Aha, and I have my other favorite, uh, my, actually the Sennheiser MD441. I've got it sitting over there. One of my all time favorite mics for voice and for um, snare drum recording actually. Yeah, Bluetooth speakers and bass monsters, yep. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> Sorry, so you're slithering a Ravenclaw. Nice. All right. Okay. Let's see, what else have we got here? Okay. Rode Procaster user there. Nice, Tim. Okay. All right, so let's go to the next one. So you've heard the 4050 kind of get an overall idea of the sound of that one. Let's cut over to the Shure SM58. Now, again, what's unique about this one, not only because it's just one of the most common and recognizable microphones in the world, is that first and foremost, again, this being a, uh, a dynamic mic, you really want to get up on it when you're singing into it. Now, when a lot of people that I know who've purchased things like the SM7, uh, many of them have written to me and they've said like, hey, I can't get enough gain out of this thing. And they wind up buying things like a cloud lifter and stuff like that, which gives you additional gain. And yes, again, if you're trying to go into some sound cards, they don't, they just don't have enough gain. The preamp circuitry, it's just not good enough. In the old days when you had external preamps, you never had this problem with dynamic mics. We have this problem now in kind of the the nonlinear uh, DAW podcast era because a lot of your sound devices simply don't provide enough gain. So that's partially why you want to get up on this mic and you really want to be here. You can be further away. You can, sorry, you can be like this. You can even be like this, but it's going to be a very different sound. And when you're like this, again, depending upon the sound you're going for, and you need to be able to monitor yourself too. That's actually how this mic wants to be used for voices, okay? It, it, it colors the sound, but in a by design kind of way. Now, the other cool thing about this is, again, this is a built-in pop filter. You can still incur uh, popping peas and plosives with this thing on here, okay? So you can use an additional filter in front of this. However, a common technique now, this microphone has a a sibling, this is the SM58. It also has a sibling known as the SM57, which curiously is usually about $10 more. Um, and it's used primarily for like miking instruments and things. Well, if you take the capsule off, this is actually what the 57 looks like. This is now a 57. 
Okay. True. There's there's no there's no difference. They are effectively the same. Do I own 57s? Yes. Slightly different. It's got this little kind of rotating capsule thing here. But essentially, if I want to use this to mic amps and I do, I take the windscreen off and you can't see here, but there is there's foam inside of this. So it's the same kind of foam thing that you would use for a windscreen or um you know, again, if you're using like the uh, the shotgun mics, uh, you know, to prevent noise and such, it's built into this microphone here. Okay, SM58. I know this may be random, but how do you adjust the volume in the beginning of a video or even the middle of a video to sound low and then rise up or fade up after someone is done talking? Emmanuel Ramos. So you can do this with keyframes in Audition or in, in Premiere. Uh, just real quickly, in the case of this, you know, if we wanted to, this is our volume envelope right here. So I could simply click, let's just say right here. I mean, I'm assuming you're talking about kind of fading in or just adjusting manually. So I can click on this. I can adjust the amplitude. You can see as I do that, it's giving me our value in decibels. So if I drop this 11 dB and gradually have this increase, if we play this back. Hi, this is Jason Levine, and you are listening to the Audio Technica. All right, I don't know if that's what you were asking, but that's how you can do it. Also, if you right click, control click on the keyframes, um, this is where you can turn them into beziers, or as they referred to in audition, splines. Okay, and then that gives you a, a much smoother sinusoidal type fade versus a linear one. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and mute this. And now let's go to the 58. All right, and let me make sure. Okay, looks like we've got good level on this. Okay, you'll also notice when there's no talking, minus 84, super low noise floor. And that's with this, this fan is cranking on this streaming system here. Um, again, a lot of your USB variety condensers, that's usually hovering around minus 60. In fact, if anybody has noticed that, throw it in the chat. I'm curious. I've seen a lot of, again, a lot more consumery mics have higher noise floors by default. A lot of that can be that the gain is just not adjusted properly, right? Very important. And I've done this on a couple streams here, but properly gain staging a microphone is not a trivial thing. It is not. It's not unlike calibrating a monitor. You, you kind of need to know what you're doing to get it right. Otherwise, while you can always amplify in post, you might be amplifying noise, which you don't want, okay? So there's there's an art to it. All right, let's record this 58 because we've got like nine minutes left. Time flies. Jennifer Poole, that's awesome. The last audio recorder used only linear. Oh yeah, absolutely. So splines are wonderful. And of course, when you crossfade, your little crossfade curves here too, uh, these can become splines just by dragging, all right? And then you have uh, additional options when you hold down like command, you'll see. So this will give you sinusoidal, let go of command control, turns it into linear. All right, cool little keyboard shortcut right there. Okay. All right, here we go. Need some water. Okay. All right. Coming to you live from the studio today in the desert. This is the Shore SM58. And as I mentioned, I might be too close because I'm not monitoring myself, but you really do want to get up on this mic. And again, you can back off of it like I do when I'm singing loud vocals, but it's really meant to be captured with hot sound. And if you use this to mic instruments and things, it's going to be real thumpy, real up close, and a very good indicator of what it sounds like. Okay. There is our waveform. It's coming to here. Let's make it a little bit louder. All right. And let's take a quick listen to this. Coming to you live from the studio today in the desert. This is the Shure SM58. And as I mentioned, I might be too close because I'm not monitoring myself, but you really do want to get up on this mic. And again, you can back off of it like I do when I'm singing loud vocals, but it's really meant to be captured with hot sound. And if you use this to mic instruments and things, Okay, so right away, you can probably notice that it's just, it's not as, it's not as bright necessarily, but here's the thing with this. If you were to go into something like your spectral frequency, 
you can you can very clearly see while there seems to be a little bit of a dip around 19 and a half to 22 kilohertz, which you're not even going to hear. It's recording frequency response all the way up to, in this case, you know, 22, 24K, all right? So this will actually react quite nicely with a little bit of subtle EQ to bring out some of the high end, all right? Now, similarly or dissimilarly, this is the condenser mic, all right? So look here, right? I mean, this is kind of the fundamental difference. Remember, the, the condenser microphones, greater frequency response, a lot more detail in the high end. So look up here. This is capturing everything, right? Even though you're, you, you can't even hear any of this up here, but it's all there, all right? Versus this one, where there's just, there's some dips, right? By nature, okay? So this one, again, it's going to be a little more forgiving with super bright, super crunchy voices. Same with the SM7B. And when you get right up on it, you're still going to capture enough of that high end so you can equalize it and bring it back and make it sound good. Okay? However you want. D Flynn's getting minus 66. Nice. That's pretty good. Minus 66 is good. People keep saying you have a face for radio. What does that mean? Ah, oh, Jan, Eric, you kid, you kid. All right. All right. Any more questions here? We're all being a little silent today. All 832 of you, but it's lovely to have you. Don't be shy. Ask, ask away. All right. What's up, Zachary? Okay. So let's now go into this one here. It's probably the last one we're going to be, we're going to have time to record. Maybe we'll do the USB one, although it's not essential to record that because I think you get the idea. Uh, this one is, is special because again, uh, the way it's mounted, uh, uh, sound rejection from the rear, super clean and just very, just it's very film like this mic. So let's go ahead. I've already got the input selected on this one and uh, let's give it a go. All right, here we are and ready, here we go. What's up? Oh yes, Mystic in Las Vegas, I know. Good to see you, man. All right, hello. Thank you so much for joining me and welcome to today's live stream. Right now we are featuring the Sennheiser MKH416 Super Cardioid Shotgun Microphone. This is an industry standard and the key to making this sound good with very little tweaking is just having laser precision when you're focusing the capsule of the mic, which is front address, to the front side of the person's mouth. If you get that dialed in, you will have perfect sound reproduction every time. Okay, so again, very nice, very clean looking waveform there. Condensers, right? Full program material all the way up to the top. Oh, by the way, it's also, yeah, it's also worth pointing out here. So again, bass roll off, right? If we look at the low end, there's nothing captured down here. It's still capturing all the low end fundamentals of my voice because I have a low voice but it doesn't have any of that rumbly nonsense that you just don't need, right? And similarly with the MKH416, same deal, all right? Right around 80, it just starts to fall off. Looks like we have a little plosive right there and maybe one right there. Not a problem, we could come in here and just knock those right out. You'd never know they were there in the first place. Maybe right here too, okay? Very cool. All right, let's take a quick listen to this. Let's amplify it like we did the others so it's a little bit louder for the stream. And here we go. All right, hello. Thank you so much for joining me and welcome to today's live stream. Right now we are featuring the Sennheiser MKH416 Super Cardioid Shotgun Microphone. This is an industry standard and the key to making this sound good with very little tweaking is just having laser precision when you're focusing the capsule of the mic, which is front address. Okay. I love the sound of this, right? I mean, it doesn't. it sounds like it doesn't even need to be edited. It's just clean, it has all of the right present frequencies for voice and it just it just sounds right that's why this one is a standard now i see alexei was just asking which dslr shotgun mic would you recommend now sennheiser has some this one is this this is again being an industry standard it's not inexpensive so there are inexpensive alternatives to those um 
And, uh, you know, you can definitely check those out. What you want to really look for is to make sure that they have preferably supercardioid or hypercardioid patterns. A lot of the shotgun mics, consumer ones, actually have cardioid pickup patterns. And again, the only issue there is that it's, it's just picking up a lot of sound from the sides. You really want it to be laser focused, all right? So, you know, Rode makes a bunch of them that are very good and fairly inexpensive. Again, Sennheiser, I think it's the MKH maybe 600. I forget the model numbers. There's a lot of good ones out there. Um, there's even one that came with one of my Zoom recorders. Zoom makes their own little shotgun that's pretty good. You know, anything in the in the two, 200 two three hundred dollar range for a shotgun, most of them are pretty good. I mean, that's the difference now is that most of the stuff works pretty well, you know? Yes, there are differences, there are variances, but overall, the stuff is way better than it used to be and for a far more affordable price. All right, and look at all those cool rainbow buttons at the top. Nice. Startup Santana, nice. Sorcery, I feel like I hear more of the S's compared to the Audio-Technica. Am I crazy? Now, you you may, uh, again, now I wasn't quite listening back full. It's It's possible that this one may be, again, accentuating... Yes, because again, I've got it right focused on my mouth here. So I might want to, yes, attenuate or bring down. Um, you usually find the S sounds approximately, the fundamental frequency is 5,600 hertz to 6,300 hertz. So somewhere in that range, I would use a parametric equalizer. I would sweep to find it, and then I would cut that frequency out. But my friends, unfortunately, that is all the time we have. So thank you so much for joining me. Of course, you'll be able to watch the replay right after this. We've got the Illustrator Creative Challenge coming up next. So until then, stick around. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you again next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.